This is the Unstoppable Amazon Academy Podcast, where we bring you the business advice, skills, and e-commerce news you need to grow a profitable, sustainable business. Welcome to the Unstoppable Academy show. This is season one and we have somebody who is one of my favorite guests, somebody that I always love to talk to, to hang out with. He's somebody that I just look up to and I say like, how can I be a little bit more like Mike? And (laughs) because the joy and the humor that he brings to his business, he is quickly becoming one of the most prolific writers in the business space. If you haven't read at least two of his books, you're missing out. You know, if you look at some of the best book lists, that are out there, they're going to talk about some of Mike McCallowitz's New York Times best-selling books, including Toilet Paper Entrepreneur, Profit First, which so many of you have heard about, Surge, which is going to be even more important to Amazon sellers as we start to work in wholesale, private label, and consulting, Pumpkin Plan, about getting your ideal clients, which does still apply to us, even as Amazon sellers. And he's got a new book coming out August 21st called Clockwork. And I got to read an early release, and there were some people is that I was so excited. I asked him for permission to share at some of the speaking events that I've had earlier this year. Some of the concepts that he has in here are so vital for us as entrepreneurs. So Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh my gosh. Thank you for having me. And thanks for being one of the early readers, Robin. You've always been such a great supporter of me, but also willing to be candid and not placate to me. Like, like, (laughs) you know, this, this part's not so good. Mike, fix this. This is really good. Amplify that. So just thanks. Thanks for that. That's the definition of a true friend. Someone who'll speak the truth to you to support you. And that's what you do. So thank you. Oh, it's it's all out of selfish means because your messages are so important <laughs> that I'm like, this is too important to step over. And I love what you do. And it's funny, some of the things in Clockwork are actually things that I echoed in a different way in my book. And these are things that I think are really what is holding back a lot of my clients from moving from 250 to, you know, $750,000 a year mark to actually having, you know, a multi-million dollar business or, you know, maybe they don't need to grow their gross sales that much, but they're trying to get from $60,000 net to $150,000 or $250,000 net. I think this is the missing piece that a lot of them are feeling like they're frustrated with right now. So can we talk a little bit about the book? Because the, you know, the subtitle is to design your business to run itself. And you know, so some people, there's going to be the cynical person that's over there being like, well, you have to always be in your business. Right. Right. So let's talk a little bit about what you're sharing in this new book, Clockwork. So I can came across, not came across, but I've been made very aware of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. And I, I'm sure everyone listening to this is familiar, at least with the term. And basically what Maslow discovered was that for human survivability, there's these different level of needs. The base need is physiological needs like, you know, shelter, food, air. Without those things, nothing else matters. But once you have those and you go up this hierarchy, there's a need for community, belonging, love. And at the highest level, there's self-actualization. And I believe in entrepreneurship, there is a similar hierarchy that is happening. Now, I haven't defined it fully yet, but like the base level, I think, is sales. Like, like if there's not inbound income, we will do anything to generate more sales. We need money flowing in. That's the oxygen of the business. Unfortunately, many entrepreneurs think that is the whole hierarchy. So all we focus on is more sales, more sales, more sales. But then we get frustrated, like, I'm not making money. I have no time for myself. So as we move up this hierarchical need for entrepreneurs, I think the next level up is profitability. Once sales comes in, we need to be profitable, which means that we're taking money home. So I have a saying, it's not how much we make, it's how much we take, because that gives us a sense of freedom, that we have confidence in our business, that it can support us. I believe the next level up, though, is recapturing time. And that's what we're talking about here, in that without, we, we, you know, you can be profitable in making sales, but if all your time is consumed by the business, you don't have time to explore life. You don't have time to do what you want. We just grind things out. I think, unfortunately, there's terms like hustle right now is a very popular one, grinding it out. And while I understand the intention is, you know, see things through to the finish line, I think people just keep on sprinting and sprinting for the entirety of their business. And there's this exhaustion that's coming about. 
So clockwork, what I did was I wanted to study how do entrepreneurs get to this third stage of our hierarchical needs? How do we get the freedom of time so the business can run itself, so the business continue to grow and be profitable on its own, and we are freed up to do what we want outside the business or inside the business that we can bring back that true balance. And I will tell you this, it's not productivity. It's not how do you squeeze more out of a day. It's about business efficiency. It's that choreographed dance of the organization. And because it's all of those things put together that makes it really work. And, you know, I talk to so many entrepreneurs that they're like, you know, everybody else looks at me in this community as, you know, some sort of God, but I'm, I'm exhausted. I don't know how much farther I can run. And, you know, to be honest, I've fallen, have fallen in that trap for a little bit where it's easy to get focused on, you know, how can I grow the business? How can I grow the business? But, you know, sometimes it's not about growth. It's about building sustainability. And by taking that time of, you know, maybe and even allowing your business to plateau for a segment that that is what really allows you to have continued growth because nobody can sustain this intense hustle over you know maybe Gary Vaynerchuk can but you know for <laughs> most of us we have kids we have aging parents we have friends that would like to see us occasionally and it's easy to lose your life in your identity into your business much like it is with your kids and so you have to really kind of make some lines in the sand and say, I'm going to start to constrain you that Parkinson's law, you know, constrain the amount of time that I have in my business so that I can make sure that I still am not so caught up in making a living that I don't have a life. Yeah. And right in the beginning, you mentioned how the outside world perceives us. And this becomes a trap. Two traps are happening. One trap is the outside world. The day you start your business, and Robin, I'm convinced people listening in right now can relate to this. The day you start your business, you, your friends think you're a millionaire yes. and think and think you don't work anymore. Like, oh, God, you have the life. You know, you have such flexibility. You can do whatever you want and you have all this money coming in. But the reality is we're not millionaires, far from it. The reverse, most entrepreneurs make less money than they could in a equivalent job. And we have no freedom of time. We work our butts off. Now, here's the other trap. The other trap is to start a business that is what you must do. When you're starting a business from scratch, you have to work exhaustively because you're the only resource available. You have to do everything. The second thing is you have no money. So any source of income is important. So we will pursue everything. That's a trap because we think that's the normal operations of a business. But the reality is that's just simply the first stage. The first stage is, is striking that rock until you spark the fire. But once with the fire, our role changes. We need to now cater to the fire to kind of stoke the coals in the flame. But most people keep on trying to keep on sparking it. So a spark lands and then they keep on sparking and sparking and sparking. And we get very frustrated. We're making more and more effort. We try to make bigger sparks, yet we're past that stage. So the perception of the outside world and the reality of a startup keeps us trapped in this work like an animal mindset. I'm a fan of Gary Vaynerchuk's work. I've had the pleasure of meeting him. He's also a New Jersey based guy and interviewing him. And I love his message, but I also realize the trap in his message. He's telling us, you know, grind it out. Where's your hustle? Push yourself. Yes. To a point, to a point where the spark gets hold. Once it does, we have to kind of retrain ourselves to now get the business to be the fuel source for us to position the logs on the fire in the right position. So if your business has some momentum, now we need to reposition ourselves by actually pulling ourselves out of the business. And in Clockwork, I actually specify a methodology, how to extract ourselves from the business very surgically and carefully so we don't hurt the business and replace ourselves with other people or systems that can now continue the fuel of the business pushing it forward. Yeah, so if you're listening and you've been stuck at a plateau, so you know some of you might be twenty thousand a month. For some of you, it might be lower. Some of you, it might be you know I'm really stuck at quarter million a month. It could be anywhere in there where you feel like you're working harder and harder, and the harder you work, you're just more tired and you're not getting any results. This is what he's talking about because there's only so much working harder can actually do. There's a limit to everybody's physical capabilities, and so the the way to to move past that is to start to have the systems and the people, the team that it really takes to have you not doing everything in your business and starting to build a business that can run it itself, even if it's a sh for a short period of time, like a vacation or a hospital stay, because nobody is invincible and everybody needs a break. Again, yeah, and sadly, that hospital stay may happen. Sadly, that vacation may not happen. As I was interviewing people for Clockwork, I, I was blown away, Robin, by how many people, when I asked them about their last vacation, referred to something 5, 10, or even 20 years ago. 
And for some people, there's this perverted pride in it that, you know, I'm a workaholic. I, I drive my business forward. I make the ultimate sacrifice. But the ultimate sacrifice, no vacation, you're sacrificing freedom to explore something outside of the business for yourself. You're, you're sacrificing the ability to recharge, but you're also sacrificing family. You're sacrificing time you'd spend with loved ones. So what we need to do is extract ourselves from the business. Here's the first step. It's a, it's a form of reverse engineering, and it is to declare a vacation. Here is the necessary extreme. It's a four-week vacation. As I was doing my research, I found that Entrepreneurs that take a week's vacation from their business will often do what we call a ramping period. The month leading up to that week they're going away, they ramp the amount of work they do. They work more hours trying to compress everything so that when they go on that vacation that there is no more work queued up and they can bridge for those seven days. So when they get back, they come back and now the work is piling up again. But they work so hard prior to that, they can bridge the one week. Two weekers try the same thing, but they often also try to take these excursions from their vacation, calling them work vacations. They sneak into the coffee shop in the morning and they send some emails, they check it again at night and they're, they're doing some stuff. They're trying to now compress their work every single day instead of working an eight or 12 or 15 hour day, they're trying to do it in two hours, which often bleeds to five or six. No one takes a three week vacation, there's no such thing. What happens though is a four week vacation, when we're away from our business for four weeks, for most businesses, that represents what I call the full cycle of business activity. Almost every business attracts prospects, creates customers during that period, has bills it needs to collect, customer problems happen that they have to serve. Every element of a business is usually touched at least once per month. So if we remove ourselves from our business, I mean really remove ourselves from business for a full month, the only way that can happen successfully is if we've put systems in place and have other machines or people to execute on those processes. So once you declare a four week vacation, that's your starting point. I'm saying pick a period, you know, a year and a half out from now. It's not for tomorrow. You'll feel a mind shift. It'll be instantly like, oh my gosh, am I doing work just to get things done? You know, another popular thing, GSD, get stuff done. Or now your mindset will say, okay, how do I get other people and other things to get this stuff done? And it changed your perspective. Then over the time leading up to the vacation, we do have to take more steps, but we consistently look for how other people can do those things. The final thing is when we go away for four weeks, we shouldn't expect a perfect business. There will be problems. If we've empowered our contractors, employees, part-timers, whatever, enough, they should be able to carry us. But when we return from that four-week vacation, that's where we explore where did we stumble? Where do we have problems? Wherever you stumble or have problems, that's the next thing you need to fix before your next four-week vacation. Our dear mutual friend, Cindy Thomason, is leaving for her four-week vacation as of us recording this in two weeks. And I just had a call with her and her husband. They planned it about 18 months in advance. We've been working through it. They feel that they're somewhere between 80 percent to 95 percent prepared for this. They know problems are going to happen, but they also have the confidence now that if problems happen, their team is empowered enough and the systems are in place enough to sustain the business for a month. And we already scheduled our debriefing call. When they get back from this four-week vacation, we're going to sit down and recap what worked, what didn't work. But I, you know, and they don't know this, what's going to happen while they're away is their business is going to learn. Those employees that are left are going to learn how to run the business. The business is actually going to improve itself. I'm actually very interested in debriefing the employees and learning from them. How did they improve the business or what opportunities did they see? Also, I know when you're away for four weeks, that's when you start realizing, oh my gosh, this is a reality. I don't need to be in my business every single day. So it's a bold decree, but everyone, I believe, as I do this research for the book, I, and I believe now everyone, including myself, needs to pick a four-week vacation. Mine's coming up end of this year. I'm out of here and, and already have put the systems in place, many systems in place to make it a reality. And I think everyone listening, if you're bold enough, needs to do the exact same thing. You know, and we did this, we did, I did a three week vacation. I've nice. done a, yeah, I've done several like two week vacations and things like that. And one of the things that struck me was there's so many things I was like, well, they're just going to do this while I'm gone. Yeah. This task, because you know, it really needs to be just me that's doing that. And then once I came back, I was like, you know what? I am not nearly as important as I thought I was. I don't need to do all of this. They're doing a great job. They've actually improved the process. This is something that's great for them. And so it opened up my eyes to things that I didn't think were possible to have my team do that I thought, oh, only I can do this piece. But once yes. I was able to walk away, when I came back, I was like, you know what? I'm Picking that item back up is not nearly as compulsive as it was. 
That's awesome. One of the biggest realizations I had, just as a little bit of background, when I write a book, I started Clockwork six years ago. When I started writing this book, the first thing I do is once I come up with theories and really hypothesis, I will start testing them out on my own companies. And whatever doesn't work, I ditch. Whatever does work, I further test it until I'm confident it works. Well, I took my first sabbatical from my business. It was a two and a half week test. I left the country, went to Australia. And the power of going there was we're on a different time zone. So even if I could connect with the office, I couldn't communicate real time. It was a 12 hour time difference. Well, the day came pretty quickly on where I woke up one morning, checked my email. There was no email from anyone in my office. That's when I came to realize, wow, my office is running independently of me. But then my ego kicked in. I said, oh my God, my business doesn't need me. And it was an ego crushing punch. I couldn't believe it, but subconsciously, I started to insert myself in the business again. I started sending emails, in retrospect, nonsensical questions or needs just to keep my employees communicating with me. And when we did a debrief afterwards, I realized I was just actually frustrating the team here. They didn't need me, so they didn't communicate, but my big fat ego got in the way. So that that's one unexpected kind of pushback we're going to get is from ourselves. As we've grown our business, it's become so dependent upon us. I don't even consider a business owner and its relationship to a business, a parent-child relationship. I consider it more like Siamese twins. <laughs> so we need to kind of surgically disconnect our shared liver and heart and even our soul to do this successfully. Watch out for your ego and that belief that we are needed in our business. I come from a Catholic background and, you know, I had a priest once that said the answer to any theological question in the Catholic church is always dying and rising. And so this kind of really is a theme. You, you have to die to this stage of your business where everything's dependent on you. You have to let go of that and grieve that and, you know, grieve the great parts of that and grieve the worst parts of that and then rise to something new where you're instead of just being the scrappy entrepreneur, now you're the CEO and you're helping land the planes. You're not piloting the planes you're still very clear on what's going on in all of the pieces of your business because you can't abdicate the throne. I mean, that's one of the biggest mistakes I ever made in my business was Trina trying to just push something off because I didn't want to take responsibility. It's about being able to have this ability to not have to do all the things and be okay with employees working in our business to having systems that are not going to be perfect and are not going to be us, but that, having that allow us to serve more people, be able to have higher profitability so that we can do good in our communities for the things that we care about. But most importantly, to be there for our families, you know, that we don't have children that we're like, you know, I, I can see this whole future generation of like support groups of my mom was an entrepreneur, you know, so, you know, now we need to have these group therapy sessions around, around that. <laughs> yeah, it's true. You know, I think the powerful mental kind of behavior that works against us is this thing called loss aversion. And we're afraid of losing control of our business. If I leave, I'm going to lose control of my business. You nailed it on the head. We have to simply redefine ourselves. So instead of seeing ourselves as losing what we did for our business, we are gaining a new position. One thing I've also come to realize is you mentioned, you know, you are really the CEO. Many people call themselves a CEO when they're not. So I start a business because I'm the founder. I can call myself whatever I want. I, I'm the CEO. But, you know, if we look at your job activities in your small business versus the CEO of Ford or Apple or you know Mary Kay, they are serving a radically different role, highly strategic, highly visionary. They're moving chess pieces on the chessboard, but they're not on the board. As a early stage small business owner, we are the bottle washer and the person d doing the strategy and, and everything in between. You're on the chessboard. So we just have to be very cognizant of the terms we use. It is not the reality of what we're doing. It's just the word we've used. I think we also need to define our role. So in addition to your title, what is your capacity? I'm the company's strategist, or I am the lead technician, or I am the leader of creativity. But we need to define that role. Once it's defined, then our colleagues, and when I say colleagues, this could be vendors, full-timer, part-time employees, contractors, or whatever, need to become aware of what that role is for ourselves. I actually have a term for it. I call it the QBR. I, I discuss this in Clockwork. The QBR stands for Queen Bee Role. It comes from my study of beehives. I'm not going to belabor because it's in the book. But just I found every business has a person or persons serving the QBR, the Queen Bee Role. And this QBR is what the company basically hinges its success on. It, it's that critical of a deliverable. Usually in a small business, the, the, the business owner needs to be delivering on this and needs to educate those contractors and employees and everyone that if I am not doing 
that QBR, the lead creative, the, the, the strategist, whatever it is, if you see me doing something other than that, we are actually slowing down the entirety of our business because we're hinging our business's success on this. So your job is to, what I call protect and serve. Protect the QBR. If you see me doing anything else otherwise, redirect me and get me off of other work because that's distracting me. Serve it, meaning if anyone else can elevate our ability in this area of strategy or whatever it is, your job is to also support that role. An analogy that may make this clear is at a doctor's office. If you go f- to see your general practitioner, I hope everyone listening sees their general practitioner once a year, but I hope you do. I really hope that the doctor, I hope she doesn't come out of the office when, when you arrive to check you in. I hope she's not pulling your file. I hope she's not escorting you from the waiting room to the next little mini waiting room that they put you in. I hope the only thing she is doing is the examination and a prescription, the course of action you need to take. Because that is what a doctor's office hinges its success on, successfully diagnosing and prescribing for its patients. Everyone else's job there is to protect the QBR so it can happen. Someone else pulls the paperwork. Someone else escorts you in. Someone else pokes and prods you in the beginning to get the basic health level check. The doctor should never do that. And the second the doctor's doing something else, the entire business is being compromised. Define your company's QBR and then make sure that is the primary job that you're serving in the beginning. And ultimately, when we fully pull you away from the business, other people are doing that QBR and you don't even do that in the future. And, you know, this queen bee role, this idea that he has in the book is one of the most powerful things. You know, if you feel like, you know, no matter what you do, you can't seem to get a handle on what's going on in your business. You can't get everything done at the end of the day. And you're feeling like every day you're just a loser because you can't, you know, if you were Mm. a good person, you would get all these things done. But you're clearly not a good person. Right. (laughs) You know, this queen bee role is kind of the key that unlocks that for you. Now, it's going to be difficult and it's going to be frustrating. It's going to be counterproductive counterintuitive for many of you, but it is something that really comes down to triaging your time and saying, you know, what is the best profit per hour? And really, so there's some humility involved as you're growing your business. There's a point where you have to be like, you know what, maybe other people can pack the box as well as I can pack the box. Right, right. We're talking about putting stickers on and taking stickers off. This is a, you know, heartbeat level task. I mean, you just need a heartbeat. There are tasks that are more skilled, but, you know, we have to get over ourselves and say, you know what? Yeah, maybe I can do it 10% faster or 20%, even 100% faster than the person I hired. But I need to have that time and I need to move it towards those highly profitable activities, those things that really are driving the growth and the revenue and the profitability in your business and not the things that feel comfortable and that are easy check marks off your to-do list. You know, one of the things I ask in the book is, would you rather make $10 an hour or $100 an hour? And at that level, the answer is very clear. I'd rather make $100 an hour. But then I go further into it. I say, what if you make $10 an hour with no effort? Someone else is doing that, and they give you at the end of each hour a $10 bill. And to make $100 an hour, you have to grind it out. You have to do all the work. Which one would you rather do? Some people still say $100. I mean, $100 is more than 10 substantially, so I'm willing to grind it out. But $10 on automatic, you know, laying back, drinking a margarita, and every hour someone comes up and gives me a $10 bill, well, that's appealing. But then when I say, what if you get $100 an hour when people just hand it to you at the end of every hour versus you having to grind it out, which is more appealing? Well, someone just handing it to you is super appealing. And then what if you could make 1000 or 10000 or a $1 million an hour with someone just handing it to you versus $100 an hour grinding it out? Well, then it becomes very obvious. I'd rather make $1,000 an hour with no effort. The only way a business can achieve that is by other people packing the box. You see, if I pack the box, I don't care how efficient, how great I am. I can do it even 10 times faster than someone else. There is a limit because it's me. If I have, and I think this is the courageous decision, if I have the courageousness and the intelligence to train someone else in the process, to create a system around it, even if the end result is they don't complete it as quickly, as long as they complete it successfully, now I can amplify people. I can hire more and more people to do this work, and now there's an unlimited cap on how much money I can make with no effort. That's how we have to see it. Yes, you can do it faster yourself, but that's not the objective. The objective is find a way for you not to do it at all. You are an entrepreneur. An entrepreneur is a designer of systems. They're the ones who find the way to get other people and other things completing tasks. Entrepreneurs are a rare breed. Most people 
like to do tasks. That's why most people want to be employees. And that's a great thing. You're the weirdo that's the entrepreneur who said, you know what? I, I actually want the business to do it for me. So we got to play into that weirdoism that we have and create the systems. It requires more effort, more time, more concentration to create systems than just doing it. So just doing it is the lazy way out. You need to create the systems, make the effort to do it. And once it's off your plate, it's the equivalent of someone walking up every hour to you giving you $10. And as you scale this out, that $10 is going to become 100 a 1000 and it can grow theoretically into billions an hour if you want it. But realistically, it can scale far, far beyond what you can ever do on your own. And for the person who's analytical out there who's like, nobody makes a million dollars per hour, Warren Buffett probably does make a million dollars per hour. And he's not saying, you know, you can start a business and then live on the beach and never do any work. He's saying you can lay on the beach and have this three-week vacation and you can still have time freedom and be an entrepreneur. But it's going to take strategy in the tasks that you do in managing your cash flow because managing cash flow is key to being able to hire. So go back to Profit First. If you know you haven't read Profit First, go back and do that and you know get those things set up. And for some of us, we've become addicted to these low dollar value tasks where you know we feel safe. It's an easy checkbox. And you're gonna find yourself, even once you give this up to an employee, wanting to take it back. Or giving it up to a country, you're gonna want to take it back, and you're gonna have to continue to choose to say that I'm worth more per hour. So I'm yeah. going to pay that amount and I'm going to generate more income doing something else. Yeah. And, you know, if you look at Jeff Bezos, because it's in our lifetime, we saw Amazon rise and, and achieve its success where it is today. You know, Jeff Bezos was packing the boxes, right? Mm -hmm. He was shipping it. Today, he still works in the business. There's no question about it. But he's at a very strategic level and he does make millions an hour, right? So he actually does it. Now, the lesson is this. As you build this freedom of the business running itself, you have the power, the election to work any way you want within the business. You can choose not to work within the business or you can choose the role you want to serve. I'd argue Jeff Bezos wants to be the strategist, the visionary, but you don't have to be that. You can define what you want. This is the reason we started the business. We started a business for inevitably two things. One is for financial freedom. The second component is to live a lifestyle that we want on our own terms. And this is how you get there, to get other people and other things executing the process. And then you elect where you want to insert yourself in the business, where you get the most joy and are the most service to your business. And it supports your financial freedom objectives. And that's really where you can start to get where it is you really wanted when you started the business. Because I feel like when people start this business, there's, you know, there's, you always have to be a little naive to start a business and not really know what, what is going to happen all the way or have a high level of optimism. And we, you know, we start our business because we want time freedom. We want to be able to have more security for our families. But again, that beginning step, it's all elbow grease. So if you're listening and you're just getting started, this is the step further down the road for you. In the beginning, it is, you have to put everything you have into it. But then after you start to move past those pieces, you do have to start giving those things up in order to be successful so that you can have a life, not just a business. And I see so many people where their businesses have become a prison cell for them where they feel like now that they're in servitude of this business and they don't see a way out for themselves. I couldn't agree more. And I think today's the day it stops. Like this is a mental commitment. It's a declaration. If you listening right now are not satisfied with where you are, you're not making enough money or you, you work too much in the business, it's exhausting you. It isn't about how you're executing. Well, it is about how you're executing, but what has to come before that is a declaration, a commitment saying no more. I, I realize what got me here today won't get me to where I want to be. I must make a transition and I commit to it. Then you start reverse engineering from your commitment to making sure the ex business executes consistently with it and it'll get you there. This is not an overnight change, but the commitment is an immediate change. Then the execution happens over time. Clockwork comes out August 21st. Now, if you order it and you send me your Amazon receipt, that you have pre-ordered this book because I want to make sure that I can do anything I can to support Mike having some really great sales because we all know that the Amazon search engine is really conversion based. So let's give him some Amazon community love here. You send <sighs> me, <laughs> me your receipt that you've pre-ordered the book. So you have to pre-order the book. So if you're listening to this after August, sorry, you, know, you should have listened to it earlier. If you send it to me before August 21st, after the book comes out, we will do a book review webinar where we 
we talk about how to specifically apply these things to your business because I think that this book is valuable and worth your time. And you guys know that I don't say that about a lot of things. So I would like you to pre-order the book. And in the meantime, I want you to start thinking about your hourly value. Where is it that you could start outsourcing? And then I want you to start discussing with your spouse, maybe taking that four week vacation. And you know, would you need a six month, a 12 month, an 18 month window in order to get ready for that? If you do that, you'll get access to the special webinar. You're going to send it to excellence at bestfromthenest.com. Even if you don't want to come to the webinar, this book is worth your time. So pre-order it now so that you, you can get it like the moment it comes out on Kindle. Mike, you are just such an inspiration to me, and your rally cry is eliminating entrepreneurial poverty. And I want to let you know that I really appreciate the, the work that you do and the number of lives that have been changed you know, by many of your books, Profit First and Pumpkin Plan and Surge. You know, there's so many of them. So I just want to let you know how much I really value what you do. Wow, I am... Uh... That means a lot. Yeah. No, this is my life's purpose. Like I, I got to do it. I'm, it's funny. I'm like almost rooted with anxiousness. Like I, I don't know if I have time on this planet to do what I got to do. <laughs> your, your support, your help. It really means the world to me. So thank you back to you. I appreciate you. Oh, thank you. And, you know, if you haven't read Mike's other books, even Google knows that Mike Michalowicz is hard to spell. (laughs) (laughs) That's true. It's It's like, yeah, no, we get this all the time. He's hard. So once you get to Michal, so M-I-C-H-A-L, it usually auto-completes. If not, just to Mike Profit First and it will come up. If you are really skilled, you can go to MikeMichalowicz.com. Yeah, if you can figure that one out. Yeah. (laughs) So that is something that is, you know, it, his books are have been something that have really helped me grow my business and grow my Amazon business and also to grow. Some of you have been looking to grow other streams outside of Amazon. He has helped me become a better business owner. Some of you know how closely Cindy and I work and the gifts that he's given to Cindy have, you know, bared fruit in my life too. So I highly recommend if you haven't read his books, go back and do that. If you're in the Academy, go listen to the Profit First webinars and get those things set up so that you have the cash flow ready when the book comes out to be able to start to hire some of these pieces. So I want to give you enough lead time to get the preparation. So as you're excited about reading this book, you can take action immediately. Mike, thank you so much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Robin, thanks to you. I appreciate you. This has been another episode of the Unstoppable Academy show, and we hope that you have a prosperous and profitable week. Are you looking to grow your business? Join our Unstoppable Amazon Academy with hundreds of video and step-by-step tutorials to walk you through the skills you need to take your business to the next level. Find out more at bestfromthenest.com forward slash academy. Use the promo code podcast to get a 14-day trial.